This programme has been recorded and is not live. You're no longer able to interact with the show, so please do not call or text as you may still be charged. Hope you enjoy the show. Good evening. Tonight, we have serious questions for many of the institutions that many people in this country respect and, uh, and trust. And that's why we are pre-recording the, the very beginning of this programme this evening. We've been dealing with issues right up until transmission. I'm talking about how institutions have dealt with a prolific paedophile in Northern Ireland. His name is Maliki Finnegan. He died in 2002, and Nolan Live has questions for the Catholic Church, for the police, and for St Coleman's College Grammar School in Newry. Two weeks ago, BBC Spotlight revealed the ex-teacher and ex-president of St Coleman's College was a paedophile priest. The BBC had to tell you. Mandy McCauley from Spotlight had to tell you that, because the Catholic Church sat on that information. I should probably be very precise tonight. What they did was they sat on the fact the existence of this paedophile until Spotlight wrote to the church and told them they were going to name him and reveal details about how the church had dealt with the allegations against Malachi Finnegan. They told the police, they didn't tell the community. So what did the Catholic Church do throughout all of this? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to step through this and we're going to take time to do it tonight. It's a very different Nolan show tonight because this is a very important story for you to get your head around at home. It's an important story for society. So let's start 1994. We know that the then Father McAreevy in 1994 knew that Finnegan was a paedophile. How do we know that? Well, he told us himself in his own words. Here he is saying it 10 days ago. In 1994, Bishop Brooks informed me of the first allegation and asked me to liaise with that victim and his family in a pastoral role. I kept him briefed about my visits and in 1995, I reminded Bishop Brooks of the duty to report the matter to public authorities. And so what? Bishop McAreevy's point was 10 days ago, he was essentially saying that he thought Bishop Brooks had reported the matter to the police. That was practice to do so. But he didn't know for sure. Here's what we know for sure. Can we fast forward to 1999? Because you see the then Father McAreevy is Bishop McAreevy. So there can be no noise around this. He is the man in charge. He's the bishop. Brooks is gone. And we have been told by the PSNI tonight that these allegations against Finnegan were only reported to them by the church in 2006. Now, this is new tonight. And I want you to think about this at home. The church is saying they referred it to the police in the 1990s. They're certainly making that inference. And the police are saying... No, it was 2006. And did the Catholic Church, when they were working with Spotlight, when they were replying to Spotlight, should I say, did they put someone to speak to Spotlight who was around at the time or who definitely knew what was going on? No. The Catholic Church put someone up who wasn't too sure when the church reported having a paedophile in their midst. I wasn't in post. I wasn't in the diocese. I think procedures and policies at that stage were not as robust as they are today. Was uh, that allegation reported to police in 1994? I believe that uh, Bishop Brooks at the time did report it. Uh, I don't think it was 94. I think it's probably 95 it was reported. No, there's, there's, we're not saying anything about uh, Ms Carville tonight. We're not doing that. She's doing her job there. But here's what we are revealing tonight. 
the PSNI is telling us they were not told until 2006. And this isn't a small incidental story, it's a legal requirement. So who's right? Did the church report a paedophile in the 90s or are the police right that they were not informed about Maliki Finnegan until 2006? And let me tell you something, the public have a right to know and I'll keep questioning it until we get an answer. When we push the bishop and the church on this this evening, a spokesperson for the church said that Pat Carville believed that Bishop Brooks did report Finnegan in 1995 and that she based that on a file note that showed Brooks asked for his legal position about reporting and the bishop said the same, but that they can't prove what the bishop did or did not do after getting that advice. So essentially, the church are admitting they can't be sure that the allegations were referred to the police. Do you know who this affects most? The victims. And we're going to give them time and space tonight. Sean, first of all, thank you for coming in. Okay. Your reaction, first of all, to learning from this programme that the police say they were only told in 2006. What's your reaction as a victim of Finnegan? Um, first of all, the delay from the di diocese um, reporting that Finnegan was a paedophile um, puzzles me. If you take, for example, if, um, if I was working in someone's house and I became aware of a child that was being sexually, emotionally or physically abused, I have a duty of care as simply um, a responsible adult to report that to the correct authorities. The, the Diocese of Tremor were in a much stronger position to certainly go forward to the police or other rel relevant authorities to report what had, what had been going on by Finnegan. But for many years, they didn't. I reported it in '96. But I reported it with fear. Yeah. For and you weren't prepared to make, make a me look statement like. at that stage. But That's you why I wasn't prepared to make a statement. But you did go to the police. But I did it to protect the possibility of it happening to other children can who you, may not be as strong as I am. Can Can you tell me what Finnegan did to you, so that yes, this um, audience understands at home, so that every one of us at home understands the seriousness of the story we're dealing with tonight? What did this man do to you? Well, um, there a warning that some of this testimony will be very, very graphic, but we're doing it tonight because the victims need to be heard. Um, it started off with hugging and heavy petting. What age were you? Ten years old. Um, late, late primary seven. And um, that progressed to kissing and then... Um, this was a grown man kissing you? He was around 60 at the time, yes. I remember a stubble scratching my face, not only 10, 11 year old. Um, from there, I progressed to um, putting his hands on my private parts in his car, um, to when I call, I first lost my virginity at only 11 years old, just outside Hilltown. And from that point, it progressed to um, what did you think was happening? Like, what does what does a what does a monster like that say to you when he's does does he try to make it sound normal? What he is? He tried to make it sound like he was he, he loved me, and that I could trust him. And I was getting attention from um, a highly regarded adult in the community. At that time, I'd just been diagnosed with diabetes and he was talking to me about diabetes and asking me questions about it. It was all very complicated to me as a 10-year-old having diabetes, but he took advantage of that. He seen that vulnerability. Where did the abuse take place, Sean? In his car, um, and from about that first time that I, when, I, when I lost my virginity, um, in his living room and in his hallway of the parochial house. And in the parochial house? Yes. And Upstairs in the bedroom. I'm sorry, pardon what, me, also in his bathroom. What does it do to a child when that paedophile 
is raping you? What does it do to your sense of, to your soul? It took me away from living those teenage years. Um, it took me away from socialising with other children of that age. Um, I noticed throughout that I wasn't having friends like other children my age in Hilltown were having because I was taken away from them. How often would he do this to you? At least once a week. Uh, sorry, pardon me, uh, on average once a week. For how, for how long? From when I was 10 years old until I was 16. Sean, no. Yeah. On average once a week? Yeah, and then when I was 17, about once a month, because I was backing away from it. Um, yeah, I'm trying to... I'm trying to imagine in my head the vulnerability that there is associated with any child of any age, but you know, at 10 and 11 years of age, uh, it is unthinkable. And this was a man who was positioning himself as a, as a pillar of, the, of our society, right? In a village, Where did you sleep at night? Back in those days, worried, mixed up, um, trapped. Trapped is a very good word for ex explaining how I felt really at any time of the day, back in those days. Mm. Um, the kissing to heavy petting to the rape. Yeah, the, we, the, the rape there was, um, we, we, we imitated intercourse on top of one another in his bedroom. Um, there was oral sex sometimes as well. Um, there was heavy petting in the, in the bath, in his bathroom, and um, on two occasions there was intercourse on me. And he asked if that would be okay. I said yes. I didn't have, I didn't have the strength to say no. What would he say to you afterwards? How much he loved me. Um, don't ever tell anyone about this. If, if this gets out, it'll ruin the both of us, it'll ruin your family. Um, it'll be stuck to you for the rest of your life. So, well, first of all, thank you, OK? Thank, thank you for you, coming yeah. in here tonight. Um, I, hope you, I hope you get a, a, a sense at home tonight, just having listened to that horrendous abuse of a child as to why we think this story is so important. Um, and we have further revelations throughout the course of tonight. Mandy McCauley has been working on this story, it's Spotlight story, and they, we, we would not know any of this without the Spotlight team having done some incredible journalism. Um, this is what Spotlight does. Mandy, give us a, a sense of who Finnegan was. Well, Stephen, let me just start off by saying that in 15 years of reporting for Spotlight, I have never had a more overwhelming reaction to a programme than for this one. In recent days, we have had testimony, we have had calls coming from men here and right across the globe, shocked, angry, distressed, who are telling me that they were groomed, they were sexually assaulted, and they were raped by Maliki Finnegan over four decades. This is a man who was in a position of power who had unfettered access to young boys for four decades. He started uh, on the staff of St Coleman's and Newry in the late 60s. He was spiritual director. He then went on to become a teacher. He was elevated to president of the school in 1976. He was involved in the boarding, wasn't he? Yes, um, he, he actually lived on the grounds when he was president so he had, of St Coleman's, so he had access to very, very vulnerable boarders. We know that he targeted first-year boarders, young boys away from home, away from their mothers for the first time. They came from right across Northern Ireland. Uh, horrific stories of how these young boys were literally hunted down by this man around the school. Really sure. horrific testimony coming in. So this is the type of man we're talking about. And this is why there are, there are big revelations to come in this show tonight. But this is why I'm not letting that first question go. When was it reported to the police? 
two different versions now between the church and the police as to when it was reported, and I want to know. Why is the timeline so important, Mandy? I think the timeline is so important because this, a lot of this story unfolded not in the 60s, not in the 70s, but in the 90s. Um, we know that the, the Diocese of Dromore were first alerted to allegations of very serious sexual assault against Maliki Finnegan in 1994. And yet, instead of alerting the authorities, instead of alerting the police, instead of telling the, the local community, a community that was teeming with children, the diocese sent Maliki Finnegan away secretly to a centre in England that treated paedophiles without telling anyone. And this they is didn't. after the, the Father Brendan Smith stuff. So this is this after the Catholic months. Church were, were, were promising to do this differently. This, this is the one thing that myself and my producer, Denise O'Connor, who's worked on this with me, just have never been able to believe that the Catholic Church yeah. sent Maliki Finnegan away secretly to England without telling anyone, without reporting it to the police, two months after the Brendan Smith story broke. In that hysteria, that hysteria that, that brought about the collapse of the Irish government, when everyone was on high alert, when, when, ch when the safety of children was at the fore forefront of everything, they sent him away. And not only that, but as, as Sean knows, they brought him back six months later to Hilltown. And as Sean will tell you, raped Sean two days after his return. Probably one of the most shocking things about In this the whole story. Hall. In the parochial house, yeah. The parochial house. It, um, he took me out for a drive in his car and um, he told me that he had a hip replacement, which he had at the same time. And he told me that uh, he had been to Spain to recover from his hip replacement. And um, then he started playing with me in the car and uh, I wanted to stop, but at that point he turned around and drove all the way back to the parochial house. I seen that as an opportunity for me to not go ahead, but I was quite taken aback by how he had not said a word from the minute he turned around all the way back to the parochial house. Now, usually when we get into the parochial house, he um, give me the hugging and kissing, we'd go into the living room, um, we'd have a chat about what's happening in the daily news or, or the weather. And then after 10, 15 minutes, um, he'd grab hold of me and he'd squash me into him along the hallway, up the stairs, and we go into the bedroom and have full sex. How, but what on age that were you? Day, um, at, at this time, I was about 16, 15, um, 15 16. 15. Um, on that day, however, when we got back to the parochial house, we got in through the door, he locked it, and we went straight upstairs and straight into full sex. <laughs> and on that day, it was much more intense than normal. He seemed to need to... That was after his treatment. Birth. Yes. After his treatment. <sighs> two, two days after, after the his church treatment. had been alerted. Now, what the church did do, we know that the church stood him down. In 1995? Yes, 1995, okay. he was retired. But the community wasn't told. <laughs> but for you, we still wouldn't know. Well, but for us, and also um, an extraordinary out-of-court settlement before Christmas by one of his many victims, um, which resulted actually in the Catholic Church taking down his gravestone under cover of darkness just before Christmas as part of that settlement. It really is extra extraordinary, extraordinary story. Now, remember Bishop Macarevi. There is no doubt he knew Father Finnegan was a paedophile since 1994. <laughs> Bishop Macarevi is the chair of the Board of Governors of St. Coleman's School. Now, we cannot put any responsibility on the school's Board of Governors because we do not know that they knew about Finnegan. But here's what we do know. We do know that Bishop Macarevi, as the chair of that Board of Governors of that school, knew that Malachy Finnegan was a paedophile since 1994. He didn't become chair until later. But Bishop Brooks chaired it before that, and he knew too. So why am I telling you this now? Well, we turn to Revelation number two tonight. What was inside that school, St. Coleman's? 
Here's what was inside it. Malachi Finnegan was featured in framed pictures hanging around the walls of that school. So we can tell you tonight that photographs of a known paedophile were on the walls of that school up until just a couple of months ago. December 2017. Our reporter Nicola Weir uh, is at that school tonight in Newry. Nicola, you're, you're outside St. 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 Coleman's uh, th this evening. It's, it's, talk to us about these, these photographs uh, that, that hung up on the school walls until just a couple of months ago. Yes, as you've been saying, Stephen, I am here outside the gates of St. Coleman's College in the heart of Newry, where that paedophile priest, Father Malachi Finnegan, was a former teacher and former president here from the 1960s right through to the late 1980, round about 1987 or the late 1980s. Now, we do know that photographs of the Father Malachi Finnegan were up in this school up until December 2017, even though Bishop John McAreevy knew about allegations that were made against that priest years previously, as you said, 1994. Now, the Nolan team have been here in Newry all day gauging the reaction of the community to the revelation since the spotlight investigation. And what I can say is that this community is in shock, but that shock has now turned to immense anger. What else are they covering up? And what are they putting before actual human beings, if you know what I mean? They're, they would rather cover things up than protect people, I think. That's what it comes across as, you know? There was a big, 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 big cover-up, you know? And Bishop McAreevy should go, in your opinion? Of course. Where should the responsibility rest? The top end. That's where all the trouble begins and then comes down the line, doesn't it? Well, the Catholic Church is ready to, ready to fall down. Why so? Well, there's nobody to prop. It, it, it says in the, 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 the cornerstone. Where's the cornerstone? There's no cornerstone in the, in the Catholic Church now. I hasn't shaken my faith. No, I still have my faith. No, no. But, as I said, there has been mistakes made at the highest authority, but hopefully... Hopefully they'll, uh, they'll um, come to some sort of a, you know, that people will be treated better, you know, in this day and age. People in Hilltown um, aren't very happy with this situation because I have friends and family that live up there. They're actually shocked, disgusted and basically up in arms. So they won't let this lie. You know, they will take it as far as it can go and the bishop basically should step down because if he knew about it then you know it's not fair you know for people to they've lost faith in him so yeah he should go Now you heard in the voices of the people there Stephen that they're very upset about what has gone on in through the gates of this school particularly relating to the photographs as well that have been hanging up on those walls up until late last year and many of them calling for Bishop John McAreevy to be held accountable for what has gone on. Now, we did ask the school about what they knew or when they knew about the allegations relating to your paedophile priest, Father Malachi Finnegan. And what they said to us is, the preceding board received communication at its meeting in February 2014 that the diocese was dealing with an allegation pertaining to Malachi Finnegan. The current governors were informed that the claim had been settled by the diocese at their meeting in October 2017. And that is what they have given to us about those revelations since that spotlight investigation. OK, Nicola Weir, thank you very much. Manny McCauley, let me come to you. So, as I'm getting my head around this, there, there are pictures on, on, school, on a school wall of a, of a paedophile. Uh, they're left up there for many, many years. Meanwhile, the victims, if they're going back to their old school, they're looking at this man being lauded on school walls. It's quite extraordinary, actually. And, and the children of the victims, that maybe they're going to that school, and there's a paedophile on the walls of the school. I know, and, and I, I, 
It, the word extraordinary doesn't, I mean, it doesn't even do it justice. Um, it, it's jaw dropping. Um, when, when we first um, wrote to the school and asked them, you know, why the, the pictures were still on the wall, um, also, you know, and also the, the, the out of court, that extraordinary out of court, or court settlement as well, prompted the, the, the removal of those pictures. But I mean, given that um, John McAreevy, Bishop McAreevy, knowing what he knew and when he knew, given that those pictures remained on that wall until, um, until just before Christmas, uh, it, it, it is just unbelievable. I mean, the Board of Governors have, have told us that they're devastated you know, by the historic abuse, um, but they passed all of our specific questions back to, to the diocese and said that it was the diocese that, that was dealing with these allegations. However, in the testimony that's been coming into us, former pupils telling us that there has always been mystery around um, the circumstances in which Malachy Finnegan left the school in 1987. Um, two or three sources telling us that when they asked teachers, you know, why has Malachy Finnegan left the school? They were told, no, don't talk about that. You know, that, that, that Ma Malachy Finnegan's name is not to be mentioned. And, and, but Spotlight asked the school, yes, so why did this wrote, teacher leave? We, right? wrote a, we wrote back to the school uh, with some very specific questions. We asked the Board of Governors if they could confirm that Malachy Finnegan had left St Coleman's College in 1987 following allegations of child sexual abuse violence and alcoholism. Now, they didn't confirm or deny those allegations, but instead they said they were not aware of the circumstances around Malachy Finnegan's departure from St. Coleman's in 1987. So just stop there. So it is the position. Is this for real? It is the position. Well, I'm reading from their, their response. Their response is... It is the position, St Coleman's. They were not aware of the you circumstances. You don't know. A teacher that had been at your school for 30 years, a former president of the school, your public statement is you don't know why he left after 30-odd years. You just don't know. Nobody knows. That's your public position, is it? They were not aware of the circumstances around his departure. Well, is, that not, is there not even questions around that? So they don't know if a teacher who was there for nearly 30 years left the school amidst any allegations of sexual abuse. They don't know. Well, it is, I mean, it's hard to believe, uh, I'm not questioning them, but 1987 is not 1967. It's not even 1977. 1987 is not the distant past. So, I mean, are there records? Uh, it is extraordinary. Uh, again, let's remind ourselves, why are we doing this programme tonight? Spotlight, as I say, they've put months into this investigation because the victims deserve answers. So I, I want to give room now to a second victim. Uh, his name is Paul Gilmore. He's joining us from our San Francisco studio. Uh, Paul, uh, Manny McCauley was telling us there are victims around the world. Uh, you're one of them. What did this man do to you, Paul? How old were you when he started abusing you? started when I was 11, when I went to the college. Um, as I said in the, on the Spotlight program, I was pretty slight in those days. I was a, a small kid. Um, I was groomed, there's no other word for it, for a number of years. And then the, um, the main incident, or the, the most significant incident, was when I was in his office one day and he uh, French kissed me um, for a considerable time and uh, eventually masturbated me to climax. You were 11? That, that was later. I mean, it started when I was 11. We'd have the the opportunity to frequently take me out of class or out of study hall to, for mass and the sign of peace was the opportunity for him to to grab and, and show me your love and show me your, show me the peace and show me your love and uh, so Sean used the expression earlier the, the big sweaty hugs um, very familiar so he was start as I say that started when I was 11 the incident in the office happened probably when I was 14 or 15, I believe. Is this still locked in? Is that what happens if you're abused? Is this still locked in your mind? Do you, do you have nightmares uh, about every it? Every detail. Every de I, haven't, I didn't have a, a, a nightmare for about 20 years until um, we started this campaign over the last couple of weeks. What are the nightmares, Paul? I, 
Uh, he's he's coming for you. Uh, you're recreating what happened. Uh, you're going over it. It's uh, I can. I'm sure Sean would vouch for the same thing. Every detail of, in my case, the one incident uh, is just vivid to this day. Vivid. Again, to the to the Catholic Church. Didn't want this to become public. I want to know exactly when you reported this. No little kind of, oh, we're not too sure about this, or we can't prove this, or we're not too sure. I want to know when this was reported, because it's in the public interest for you to tell the public when you reported this to the police. And for the police, you've said 2006. How are you reacting now? You tried to track him down, Paul. When you, when you grew up, when you got older, and you were told what? They, they, they buried him. Um, I, I made some calls. Who I, I told you enough. that? Who said that? Uh, a priest in a parochial house. Um, I, I made some calls to various parochial houses uh, to try and track him down. I had the, there, was, there was no contact details. You couldn't get a hold of him. There's no phone number. Nobody knew where he was. And eventually, um, I talked to a priest, I believe it was in Uri, but I, I couldn't swear to that. And he said, you'll never find him. They've buried him. And just to be clear, and, we don't uh, know where that priest was. So let's, let, let, let's just stick to no, facts no, tonight. No. Um, so yep. they said they buried him. Of course, you found him. And when you did find yeah. him, can you remember that moment you looked into his eyes? Yes, I can. I, I, I tracked him down in Newcastle. There was no phone, and no number. So I drove down on a Sunday afternoon uh, walked up. It was a nice detached house. Um, went up to the door, rang the bell. He came out, and and it it was throwback. It was exactly as he'd gone. Oh, come here, hello. And I said, get away from me. Do not put your hands on me. And uh, he 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 staggered. I actually I hoped he was having a heart attack. He staggered against the door frame, and I thought for a second he was going to go down. And he recovered, and um, then he went back to the room he'd come out of and closed the door, because I could hear the chatter. He always had people over for lunch. And he closed the door so that they wouldn't hear what was it, whatever was going to be said on his doorstep. And he came back, well, he came back to the door by which stage I I looked at him, expressed the contempt I felt for him, and turned him a heel and walked away. Paul, Paul, I know that when you were giving your story to Spotlight, you describe a moment um, when this man attended your own father's funeral. I just want to let everyone see how you described this when you were speaking to Mandy McCauley. On the day I buried my father, And the day I buried my father, when I was ready to take his coffin out of the hearse and walk him through Warren Point, because we decided we were going to carry him the, the length of the town, that man came up to me and shook my hand. And I didn't, I couldn't hit him, get into it with him, refuse to shake his hand, and he took absolute advantage of my father's funeral and, and the situation I was in to put this, you know, we're all friends together. A precious moment of your father's funeral when he went there. Paul, would you stay with me, please, sir? And thank you for your testimony. Sure. This is an important uh, night. Um, we have even more on this story tonight because since the BBC Spotlight programme aired. As Mandy has been saying, many other victims have come forward to their, their show. Um, from all over the world, Mandy, is that right? All over the world. Uh, and it's not only victims that have come forward, Stephen. It's very important. There's a lot of family members who are contacting Denise and myself and 
people saying to me, a, a woman rang me the other night um, and she said, I think my son was abused. And she said, for the first time in 30 years, things are falling into place. Things suddenly make sense. And there's so many people ringing me and saying that. It's as if, uh, um, there's people ringing um, saying, you know, I can remember the feeling of terror when he came into the first year study room, praying he wouldn't pick me out. Um, he came into the assembly hall. He took me into the small chapel, told me he was preparing me for the priesthood, that we would say private mass. He started to hug me. He mm. French kissed me. He was obsessed with masturbation. This, 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 this story, to give you a sense also, so the Nolan radio show um, over the last 24, 48 hours, we're starting to get people contacting us. Um, I know today we had a person who, who contacted us to tell us that um, when, they were, when they were a child, that the, that, that the other children would have said, do not get into a car with that man or you'll get felt up. And they were talking about it. This was so openly known that they were talking about it uh, to each other. And just to reach out, you know, we are reaching out to the victims tonight. If you want to, if you want to contact the BBC, we will be continuing with this story. We're, this story is not over. Let me assure everybody in this country, when we get a hold of a story, when Mandy or I get a hold of a story, uh, it ain't over, all right? You want to contact Mandy? Get her at the BBC. You want to send me, if you're a victim, if you want more answers, let me tell you. You see, when they don't answer me, that's motivation. Nolan at bbc.co.uk. That's my email. It's all you need. To another victim now. See, that's what we can do. Let's give the victims voices tonight. Dermot. Hi, Dermot. Hi, Stephen. Thank you for coming in. So this is a big day for you, Dermot, because you've just told your family today? Yes. Just today. What I, did you tell them? I told them what happened. Um, I told... I first told my son at about five o'clock and then my mother at about six because I, I wanted to come on the show and uh, talk. Um, thank you for trusting us, okay? And I mean that from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Tell us what happened to you. Well, I was the same as, as Paul and some of the, the ones that Manny's saying. I was taken out of the study hall. Um, at a, How old were you? Uh, started 14 into 15. Um, it was the same uh, period. Uh, he would take me out off and took me up to the chapel. Um, and we would have the service. And it was the same. It would start somewhat innocently. I th always th presumed it. He was, I was a candidacy for the priesthood. And uh, it was the sign of peace at the same time. It was the opportunity. Started with a shake of the hand and then it was, oh, you, you can show more than that. Let's, you know, we can do more than that. And uh, so it was a hug. And then it just progressed every week to the, the burr hugs that the guys are talking about, the squashing. Um, and then it was the kissing on the cheeks and then the fondling, sort of buttocks area and around that and then, and then kissing on the lips. Uh, and that's when it stopped, fortunately for me. Uh, I was one of the lucky ones. It stopped. I, I was. I did a bad thing in the school, sort of naughty thing. What did it do to you, as an individual? Uh, that's hard to hard to say. To be honest, at the time, I never really thought much of it. I, once it stopped, I put it out of my head and just went on. And we're we're going to reveal something, and, and a quite extraordinary revelation. And there, you know, as if pictures of a paedophile on a school until a few months ago, isn't it, Alf? As if the church, not quite being sure when it was reported. Well, this abuse report, uh, reported isn't enough. We're about to reveal something that you won't believe. Um, but when you, 
when you have sat here tonight and you're hearing what the Catholic Church have said, how does it make you feel? It's a lot of it's denial, really, isn't it? I, 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 I find it astonishing that, that they're even, in this day and age, still trying to kind of deny it. It does an extent or try to make light of it, especially the school. I'm more disappointed with the school itself. The only now error brush them out. It's almost as if they're trying to... Can you imagine if you had to come back to that school and his picture's up on the wall? Yeah. If you had come back there six months ago, his picture was on the wall. Yeah, I mean, to say they're horrified is, you know, fair enough. We'll, we'll take his picture out of the photographs and if you have any... If you're a victim or any information, go to the PSNI. It's like, push it away. It sounds like they just want to push it all away from, from themselves. And I think the school have a lot, a lot to answer for. Thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. So I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that all of us tonight in this collective experience of watching this programme are getting a sense of the life-enduring trauma that people have, have gone through because of this paedophile priest Malachy Finnegan. And we have tonight a new major revelation that concerns the current bishop, Bishop Macarivi. The current bishop. What you're about to hear from Mandy McCauley tonight, remember the context of Bishop Macarivi categorically knowing that this man, Malachy Finnegan, was a paedophile since 1994. And yet, in the year 2000, here's what Bishop Macarivi did. Well, Stephen, um, I can now reveal that in 2000, Malachy Finnegan stood on the altar of St. John, the Evangelist Church in Hilltown, and along with a number of other former priests of the parish, he helped Bishop Macarivi celebrate the 150th anniversary mass for the parish of Clunduff, celebrating everything that was good about the parish. So, we now know that in the year 2000, Bishop Macarivi stood on the altar beside the prolific paedophile and was celebrating mass. So think of this. A bishop stood beside this man. That bishop, Bishop Macarivi, he knew that Finnegan was a paedophile and he stood beside him and he said mass with him in front of a congregation that could have had his victims among it. This was a major event in the church's history. A big day for the diocese and he allowed a paedophile to celebrate holy mass with him. Bishop Macarivi, why? Listen to this question from me. Why? What does it say about your judgment, Bishop? We have put this question to the Bishop, Mandy. Well, a spokesperson for the Diocese of Dromore has confirmed that Malachy Finnegan did take part in this public mass in 2000. In fact, the paedophile priest was vested, in other words, robed in priest's garments, with the other priests in attendance before the arrival of Bishop Macarivi. But we are told he was not the main celebrant or the preacher. But we do have him placed, Stephen, placed very firmly on the altar at this anniversary mass in his priest's garments. And of course, children present there at that mass. And, 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 and the church is saying, but Malachy Finnegan was ill. Well, the spokesperson told us that Bishop McGreevy himself had been very surprised by Malachy Finnegan's unannounced attendance at the Mass. Uh, we understand the Bishop felt that because Malachy Finnegan's ill health had made him increasingly difficult to manage, that a spur-of-the-moment decision was taken not to confront him just before the Mass. The spokesperson also stressed that the Bishop visited Malachy Finnegan a few days later and remonstrated with him for attending the Mass and instructed him not to do uh, it again. Uh, Bishop Macarivi, a spur-of-the-moment decision? Your spur-of-the-moment decision was to put a paedophile on an altar. So you made a spur-of-the-moment decision that that would be in any way OK, did you? Well, what a spur-of-the-moment decision that is. 
pardon me for butting in, but um, I see that as glorifying a paedophile. By, by Finnegan being allowed to take part in that mass, the community of Hilltown have seen him in poorer health than before. They've seen him as this great man that's gone to this effort to help us with this celebratory mass. He's glorified. And Bishop McCreevy has glorified a paedophile. Well, clearly, Bishop McCreevy that, would... That, clearly, that, clear, that hurts. Well, that cl hurts. Cl clearly, Bishop McCreevy would say that uh, he has not, that he ab abhors paedophilia, um, that, th that this came upon him and he didn't realise that Finnegan was going to be there, that, that he went out and he criticised Finnegan later. But that's how it made you feel. Bishop McCreevy, that's how it made a victim feel when you took this spur-of-the-minute moment decision to put a paedophile beside you. But he had those moments before the Mass to stop it. It only takes a moment to stop it. He knew he was a paedophile, so why did not step in when he had the power as bishop to stop it? Instead, he decided, in the, with the position that he's got, to allow him to carry on celebrating the anniversary Mass. You can't justify that. I'm absolutely livid. Carry on. What do you say to Bishop Macarivi tonight? We have lost the line to San Francisco this evening. I do know that, that Paul Gilmore is calling for the bishop to resign. He says his position is untenable. What is your view? I'm not calling for him to resign. I'm tell him, telling him he's not fit to be in the position that he's in. He has to resign. He has to. What, what, what we are doing tonight is we, we are dropping other items that, that was going to be on the show tonight, that, so, so, you know, what's unfolding here this evening. Uh, so forgive me for doing this, but can you just tell me in the gallery how long we have to the total end of the programme, please? OK, OK. Um, are you OK? Yeah, yeah, carry on. Carry on, yeah. You're very brave and it's very humbling to sit beside you, Sean. You really are. In, you've inspired so many other victims around the world. Incredibly humbling to sit beside you. But when you move forward after Incredible. years of psychotherapy and counselling and put those practices into place and you think you're making progress and then the knife is stuck in again and twisted and then you move forward again with more psychotherapy and counselling and when you've moved on you think you're making progress yet again it's stuck in and twisted and twisted. Where does it stop? When did it begin? When did they have the opportunity to say, hang on, we need to get him out? But they didn't. So, I'm just... And Stephen, it's not just the church. It's important to remember also that Sean reported his, uh, his allegations that he had been sexually assaulted from the age of 10 to the police in 1996. And there's now... The police ombudsman's now investigating the police and why they didn't follow that through or even interview Finnegan in 1996. Well, the, the, the police um, have confirmed to the Nolan Show that um, they got a, a report of sexual and physical abuse in 1996 from a 17-year-old, but they say that the IP did not wish to make a formal complaint and therefore they were unable to um, in, investigate or pursue this, uh, pursue this investigation. There, there are questions here for the police. There really are questions here for the police. So what happens when, when Sean came to you? You're just not able to do anything, is that it? Because, Sean, obviously, you were too frightened to tell. You were too frightened to take a complaint. You were only 17. I was too frightened. Can of I, course I was. And I... at that time, if, if, if even today, if I, if, for example, make a scenario up, if, if I knew Joe Bloggs <laughs> shot dead Joe Soap and uh, I went to the police and said, I know Joe Bloggs shot dead Joe Soap, I'm reporting it to you, I've got, there's all the evidence, but I don't want to deal with it because then I'll get into trouble. What would the police do? They'd deal with it okay. because they have to. Let me, with what I reported, I, they had to deal with it. Can I, can I ask, just in the very front row here, can I ask why you have come into the studio tonight? Why have you come here tonight? To show our support to John and all the victims. And we're from Hilltown and the community's just distraught, totally broken. 
and really don't know what to say. We're just what's the mood? Heart goes out. What's the mood, uh, Magella? Yeah. What's the mood in your community? We're dev devastated. We're just devastated. Now, just at the weekend, the parish priest, Father Byrne, told parishioners he would not be staying in the parochial house for the foreseeable future in Hilltown. Just to make it very clear, there are absolutely no allegations against Father Byrne whatsoever. Here's what he told parishioners just last weekend. And I was talking to the bishop this morning, Bishop McGreevy, and it's been decided that I no longer be staying in the parochial house here at night in light of what has happened. It's been arranged that I stay in the parochial house in Warren Point for the time being until something is sorted out here in the parish. Um, there are some locals who have said they'll never set foot in that parochial Absolutely, house yeah. again, right? You know that? Absolutely. I've been told by local people in, in Hilltown who say, um, we know that a boy... You know that Sean was raped there over many years. We, how could we set foot in it? How could we recognise it? How could we? Um, people who were shocked but are now, Stephen, very, very angry. Very angry. Uh, so we, we come full circle. And the question we have, and I'll say it again. You see, when I have a question around something like this, it doesn't go away. All right? Let me assure you of that. Bishop McAreevey and the Catholic Church. Would you just check for me? When did you tell the authorities? When did you do it? To the PSNI. You're telling us according to your files, the Catholic Church told you only in 2006? What is your public reaction to this? We've actually got Paul back in our San Francisco <laughs> Our studio, Paul Gilmore, a victim of Malachi Finnegan. Paul, what are you calling on, the, on Bishop McAreevy to do? What's your message to him tonight? It's fairly straightforward, Stephen. Um, his position has been untenable for years. All the, the rolling tide of revelations that's happened over the last two weeks since Mandy got involved and, and the work that she's done and the Spotlight crew have done. They've just reinforced that. He, he has to resign. He hasn't got any alternative. He's got a scrap of decency. He has to quit. Um, you know, I work in corporate, the corporate world. If, if you take this at its height, it's negligence. If you take it at its depths, it's malfeasance of the highest order, but even at the negligence end of the, of the spectrum, his position is untenable. One final question to you, Bishop McAreevy, from me. You stood on the altar in front of children in 2000 when you knew you were celebrating mass with a paedophile. Was that the right thing to do? Well, look, we, we, we just have a few minutes left of the of the program tonight um, if you do want to engage in this on Twitter at Stephen Nolan you can engage on it right throughout the night we're coming back to this subject I've said it's not going away it ain't we're on this tomorrow morning at nine o'clock on BBC Radio Ulster and the Nolan show again let's give more local people a, a, a voice now uh, Artie you're a, a local resident in the Hilton area correct yeah how do you feel about this like everybody else in the community, uh, I and uh, people feel very shocked. Uh, they feel very strongly about the whole issue. And people have a lot of questions which they want answered. And they want clear, precise answers to questions uh, around this whole issue. Some people go as far as say that they want the parochial house raised to the ground. Uh, the, the amount of anger within the community is, is just palpable. Well, well, well obviously, when, when you talk about that happening with the parochial house, what, what, what you need to do and what we need to emphasise tonight is let's let the lawful authorities deal with all of this and, and look at this calmly, because that's what we're talking about here tonight. We're talking about what should have, ha should have happened within the realms of law and order. Have you communicated, 
Have, have local residents communicated their anger and their dislike for that parochial house to the church? Yeah, I understand that they have. Uh, there's a group of parents whose children are due to be confirmed quite soon. And they, along with people in, in neighbouring parishes, uh, have Some insisted that uh, the, the current bishop does not uh, officiate. Guy here, second, second row at, at the end. Go ahead, sir. Yes, I'd just like to ask why there's never prosecutions in these cases. I don't mean about the individual paedophile who the allegations are brought against, but how many times and how many years are we going to have to listen to that these allegations are brought forward, the people in charge and people who are actually employing people who may be accused of sexual misconduct and there's never any prosecutions brought against people who could well, there be is seen a, to be withholding evidence? Well, there is a legal requirement to, to report um, uh, if, if you do know uh, about abuse, there is a, a safeguarding legal requirement to report that. My, my, my goodness, uh, Mandy, let, let's, let's go over again um, what you have uncovered here and, 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 the, and the depth of not just despair but anger that there is within the victims and indeed the community. Well, I said at the outset, Stephen, and, and I'll say again, in 15 years working for Spotlight, I have never, ever... Uh, experienced a response like the one to, to our Spotlight programme two weeks ago. People from all over the world. We started out, Denise O'Connor and myself, we have worked 24-7. People say to me, why do you do it? Why do you give blood? And it's, it's because the victims deserve answers and there are, there are so many people who have very, very serious questions to answer. The church, the police, the police have very serious questions to answer. Uh, we broke yesterday that uh, a group complaint has gone in to Michael Maguire, the police ombudsman, about why the police did not properly investigate uh, Sean, Sean's allegations in, 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 in 1996. What happened there? Yeah. So we will be working on okay. in this. Uh, it's not over for Spotlight. Okay. Mandy, uh, thank you. Uh, we, we know, let's just uh, recap again, um, because we want to be very fair, as fair as we can be to Bishop McAreevy in this situation. Had he come into the studio, he was invited to come in. Had he have come into the studio, he might very well um, have reminded you that he has publicly apologised to the parish in recent weeks for any hurt caused. Also that the decision to allow Finnegan can celebrate the 150th anniversary Mass in Hilltown was a spur of the moment decision. If he had be, uh, accepted our invite tonight, he might have said that Finnegan was ill, arrived at that, uh, on, on, uh, that Mass uh, unannounced. And Mandy, <laughs> one final, and we've, we've literally got 40 seconds left here. When Finnegan was being buried, 2002. Who buried him? Bishop John McAreevy officiated at the funeral of Malachy Finnegan in 2002. Okay. If you have been affected by any of this, you can find help um, on our web website page. There it is, bbc.co.uk uh, slash Nolan Life. There's the address. Um, I know it's been a different Nolan Live tonight. It's been a very, very uh, important programme. There are many, many questions uh, that, that remain. Uh, I want to give my personal thanks to, to the victims who have come into the studio tonight. Thank you so much for trusting us, Sean, Paul and Dermot. And we're back in this tomorrow morning, 9 o'clock, Radio Ulster. Good night.